Welcome and good morning. Thanks so much for coming to this panel. I'm Sonia Williams, your moderator for Oral and Visual Feast, Biography in Different Forms. We're pleased that you chose to spend part of your morning with this distinguished group of award-winning writers and media creators. The work of Marilyn Nelson, Julia Swag, and Barbara Allen are excellent examples of how poems, podcast, and film can be compelling mediums for biography. Each of our panelists will offer a sample of their work, and then I'll ask questions about their process. During the second half of the hour, you'll be able to ask any burning questions that you might have. So to uh, really start things up, um, first I'd like to, to go with Marilyn Nelson. She's a prolific writer of adult and children's books. She's an educator and she's the former poet laureate of the state of Connecticut. So it should be no surprise that Marilyn Nelson employs poems to explore the lives of people like Emmett Till, and George Washington Carver. She's continued that tradition with her latest book, Augusta Savage, The Shape of a Sculptor's Life, published in January of this year. Augusta Savage was a gifted and influential visual artist during the Harlem Renaissance of the 1920s and 30s. So Marilyn, could you please start by reading a couple of selections from your Savage and Carver biographies? I'd be glad to, thank you. And uh, thank you for the gracious inv invitation, Sonia. You're welcome. Um, the, uh, the life of uh, Augusta Savage, uh, my book has a subtitle, The Shape of a Sculptor's Life, because the first thing that occurred to me when, when the thought appeared to write about a sculptor was to try to write some poems that had the sense of being sculpted and one of the one of the challenges there are many challenges in that but one of the challenges was finding enough recognizable figures to be drawn on the page uh, i was drawing with the with the computer uh, like writing like drawing with a typewriter um, coming up with enough recognizable figures that people would understand what I was doing. Um, so the, one of the, the first, um, sculptural poems I wrote for this book were just little sketches of ducklings because those were the first, uh, shapes Augusta Savage made as a child out of clay little ducklings and I made, I think, a series of three increasingly complex ducklings. And then uh, there's this poem, which that one, you had a picture of it, did you? Yes, so, let me bring that up. So while the image is, is coming, the, uh, the, um, the background here is that um, Savage was, was I think the eighth child, I'm sorry, my memory is truly going. She was near the end of a, near the middle of a very large family. I think there were 13, 11 something children in the family. And this is a poem about the, the, um joyfulness of this care of this family the joy of um, of the family and the garden figure let me see why is Aha. the the poem i'm reading is uh it's only about the joy of being in a in a family that welcomes every member of the family. You don't have the picture, I'm sorry to say. Uh, and I don't know. Sonia, I am so sorry. I didn't realize what was happening here. So the, the picture you have is a one of 
Augusta Savage's sculptures um, and it shows the incredibly accurate realism of her work. You could look at the folds of the of this child's arm at his underarm or at his at his elbow, the the closeness of detail that she's describing in that in that sculpture. But the but the um, the poem I want to read is shaped like a hand. And it's called Fingers Remember. And um, for this, I, I um, drew an out, uh, thank you, drew an outline of my own hand on a, on a piece of um, paper and then put it on many diff different pieces of, of uh, paper and doodled on the computer to try to make the form fit the shape. And let me just read the poem because I know I'm talking way too much. So this is, um, it's about the joy and of, of, of this welcoming family. Long fingers, how signals flow up them from tip and fingerprint all the way up the arm and the neck to whatever magic light takes flame. So touch ignites as the palm smooths warm from one person to another, passes sunlight one skin has taken in, which the other receive, receives like thirsty soil gulps rain, and infinite generations of ancestors yawn awake, asking if it's time for the line to miracle up a new life. They were so young, and innocence is a birth gift intended all along to be opened with love, promises, and blessing as you enter the future that only exists if you live into it. His name was John. His moving muscles formed shapes she had not met before. Green thyme laid its fragranced landscape before them. So they entered, married. Irene came soon. At 18, Gussie was widowed with a toddler older than her youngest siblings. The family's hand opened and closed in welcome. But fingers remember. Wonderful. Wow. Thank you. So this is just um, the early, the first love, the two early marriage, the child, the early being early uh, widowed and uh, trying to visualize at the same t at the same time. Why did you or what are some of the um, advantages and disadvantages of writing someone's life in poems? I'm, uh, let me see. I suppose uh, some of the advantages are that um, poems are like my poems in this case are like snapshots of one moment in in a poem in a person's life and I don't have to write all of the filler that comes between two scenes that may be five or six years apart I only give the two scenes that suggest the arc of movement from from one scene to the other. So that's the advantage. Um, disadvantage, I suppose, is if readers are running more and need, feel they need to have the, the intervening information. In this case, um, we added uh, a, a detailed afterward that tells the uh, uh, more 
complete story of Augusta Savage's life. Why did you choose to write about her? I mean, I've seen pictures of her work and really admired it, but never knew much about her life. So what drew you to her? I was um, invited and encouraged to write about her by my agent, Regina Brooks of Serendipity Literary Agency and her friend, Charles Kim, um, they have the idea of um, biographies of African-American artists, female artists, and um, this was the first person they wanted to experiment with by sending her out. And, and um, they asked me if I would be interested in writing about her. And I didn't know much about her, but her life is very interesting and has lots of peaks and valleys and um, and the challenge of writing sculptural poems was too much for me to resist. <laughs> exactly. The thing also that is great about your book is that it is peppered with illustrations of her work. Right. So right. was it difficult getting those um, copies of her work and then permission to use it and was it costly as well? How, how did you come about that? The, uh, okay, again, I have to give Regina and Charles a, a lot of credit for this because they um, knew what we were going to be facing if somebody didn't set it up ahead of time. So they uh, had invited Tammy, oh, Tammy ah. Lawson, um, who is uh, the arts curator at the Schomburg Library to be a team member. We were a team working on this book and most of the works that we're familiar with of Augusta Savage are in the Schomburg collection. So she could make arrangements sort of behind the scenes. Uh, and then she, because she's a curator, um, she also knew where most of the other works were and was able to make connections for me. Um, and, but I had to, uh, I had to pay for the rights for the things that were not in the Schomburg collection. And that was a series of punches to the jaw. Um, <laughs> yeah, because they can get rather expensive. <laughs> so I'm sure that there'll be qu plenty of questions that'll come up later on. But thank you so much for sharing this portion of your work. And then we'll obviously get back to you in, in a little bit. But I want to move on, and um, the next up is Julia Swag, who is um, a New York Times bestseller, and um, her 2021 book, Lady Bird Johnson, Hiding in Plain Sight, um, served as the basis for her podcast. So let me bring up, uh, Julia, let me bring up your uh, work, and then we're going to share a portion of her podcast. Sonia, do you want me to introduce, hi everybody, do you want me to set up this clip at all before you play it or should we just play it and no, then discuss play it? play it and then you can, you know, okay. go in. All right. All right, so here is, uh, can you see the, the book cover? This is a copy of your book, can you see it? Yeah. All right, cool. And then here is the artwork that goes along with the podcast, which is available you know, in, in uh, whatever podcast um, uh, mechanisms you have available. Let me play the clip. From Best Case Studios and ABC Audio, this is In Plain Sight, Lady Bird Johnson. I'm Julia Swig. Lady Bird invited LBJ's two longtime doctors to drive out to Huntland for dinner. 
Lyndon had a major heart attack at Huntland almost 10 years ago in 1955. It's never really out of mind for either of them. So at dinner that night with the doctors, she'd heard what they thought about his fitness. They were going to give him a thorough medical going over the next morning. And tonight, we only talked about the psychological aspects. I don't know, though, that either one really understands the depth of his pain when and if he faces up to the possibility of sending many thousands of American boys to Vietnam. Both Lady Bird and Lyndon can see the writing on the wall. Vietnam could easily derail his presidency, their ambitions for civil rights, the sweeping great society programs he's just laid out. Before his doctors leave to go back to Washington, Bird hands them an envelope marked personal, but its contents are political too. On the phone the night before, Lyndon had asked her to set out the pros and cons. I wrote out for Lyndon about a nine page analysis of what I thought his situation was. First, she types out that press release. It's a bit of psychology. This is what it would feel like to announce you're not running. Then on a spiral bound steno pad, Lady Bird writes those nine pages laying out his options. This letter, or what I think is more accurately her strategy memo, has been sitting at the LBJ library forever, pretty much overlooked by historians. When I came across it and then tracked Bird's diaries for the rest of LBJ's presidency, I could see how important it really was. She can't know what's coming. Just how much Vietnam or urban riots or 60s counterculture or assassinations or black power or campus protests would rock the country and the White House. In May of 1964, Bird tells Lyndon that the pros outweigh the cons. I think he ought to run, facing clearly all the criticisms and hostilities that will come our way. And then, some three years and nine months from now, in February or March of 1968, announced that he won't be a candidate for re-election. Now, I have to stop here for a sec. On March 31st, 1968, that's about four years from now, LBJ will shock the nation with the announcement that he's not running for re-election. Everyone assumes then, and this is how it's been written about for years, it's the quagmire of Vietnam, the political challenge posed by Bobby Kennedy. All these factors have convinced Lyndon that the country's not behind him anymore. But he'd actually been sticking to the plan he'd made four years earlier with his closest advisor, Lady Bird. All right. Do you want to talk about what that clip is from? And by the way, this podcast series is a series of eight episodes um, that include over 100 hours worth of Lady Bird Johnson's auto diaries. So, Julia. Thank you, Sonia. Thanks, everyone, for, for joining. Um, this particular scene, Sonia and I chose to play for you because it really... It doesn't accomplish everything that we'll talk about, but it does give you her voice describing her experience at a seminal moment and a totally, almost entirely unknown and unwritten moment in the LBJ presidency. We all know that he stepped, he announced he wouldn't run again in March of 68. What that document and her account of it demonstrated to me was how significant her influence was. And the there are 123 hours of Lady Bird recording her contemporaneous experience in the White House. And that's obviously just a tiny snippet. Um, the book that I that came out last year does, I think, justice to her story and to centering her inside of the Johnson presidency where she is needs to be. But the audio, of course, gives you such a richer flavor of her. And, you know, she was a journalism major and a history major when she was in college in the 1930s. And the decision that she made at the outset, starting with her first diary entry, her first audio diary, she recorded them all as audio and then transcribed them was an account of the assassination of JFK in Texas. And it goes all the way through the end of January, 1969. 
So it's the whole, it's the, it's the full Monty of the Johnson presidency through the woman eyes and voice. And as a journalist and historian who was hell bent on documenting his legacy, who understood that it would be decades until historians could really fully get their heads around the totality of that presidency and who understood her own role. You know, I think it's important to, to note that she had such a sense of self-worth and such a sense of self-respect and had, because of her partnership with him, the opportunity to really not just participate in decisions upside and downside of that presidency, but also then to document it, it in real time. And then she went on after the presidency to be just an essential member of the, the team that put together the LBJ library. She's the one that made the decision to declassify his tapes way earlier than she need have done that. She's the person who held back on the release of her own because, you know, she had a kind of traditional, quite, you know, gendered marriage in some senses, but in other senses, a totally modern partnership and marriage. So um, that's the short end of, of that particular episode, because it kind of overturns also the conventional wisdom on, on the LBJ presidency in so many ways. So, but did the library um, allow for uh, the use is one thing to have access to these tapes and to listen to them and all, or read the transcripts. It's another thing to say, I want to use this in a series and edit the tapes um, to, to create the soundscape and, and the storytelling that you did um, in, in audio form. So what did you do to get that kind of permission? Sonia, that was just dumb luck because all of this material is in the public domain. And Lady Bird was not, you know, this is something about a first lady, right? She wasn't technically a US government official. So it was her own personal decision to put everything into the public domain. It's not governed by, you know, periods of classification and declassification or, you know, and even, so when it was fully released, there was no restriction and mm -hmm. is no restriction and I didn't have to pay any money to, or nor did ABC to use that material. So that, I mean, and that I think goes to the richness of the, what's in the national archives and in the presidential library system and the, you know, the, the value of, of hunting for unexcavated material that doesn't have to be licensed and paid for. <laughs> That's amazing. Now, you're a writer and a scholar, um, but did you have, when you were going into the whole process of writing a biography, a traditional biography of Lady Bird Johnson, did you have audio experience? Um, did you have the kind of experience to go into what it takes to produce those this kind of intense and extensive podcast? No, um, I so didn't. <laughs> I mean, I had lots of experience on radio and television as a speaker, but not as a producer at all. But I, you know, I was just very, very lucky again, because um, when I was in that, you know, dead period between completing the manuscript and the book coming out and not having another book and flailing around for my next creative project, um, I was in New York and, and had coffee with a friend of mine who had been in film and television for a long time and had just started his own startup to produce podcasts. And that's where you see in the artwork, Best Case Studios, which is a small startup um, that started up right as COVID hit. And we decided to give a go at producing something from the Lady Bird material. Um, and so his, he assembled the team and the two of us together wrote the scripts and then his team of editors and <clears throat> audio archival researchers pulled together all of the other archival material that's in the show. But we also, the, you said we were going to talk a little bit about the business of doing this. What he did is we created first a deck and a trailer. So just a three and a half, four minute trailer of me introducing it with some archival and some ladybird and a very beautiful, visually beautiful deck. And he has representation at WME and WME is sort of 20 something podcast agent 
took it out onto the market. And we had, by the end of the experience, about four different offers. And at the very end, ABC News came in and we decided to go with ABC News as, and that was the first time. And so, you know, the podcast industry has exploded just since we started this, certainly since I started writing the book, but the the whole play on uh, in the world of podcasts now is about intellectual property. So ABC bought the podcast, but with an option to convert it, the book, not just into the podcast, but into a documentary film. And we, to use a technical term, bifurcated the rights, meaning I kept the rights on scripted adaptations, but ABC has now we're going to see a rough cut soon. The the documentary, a documentary film will come out next year, directed by Don Porter, the the filmmaker, um, based on the book and the podcast. So the whole sort of chain of command, food chain of IP starts with the book, goes to the podcast, goes to the documentary, and I don't know if there'll be anything scripted. Wow. So I didn't know I didn't know how to do any of it, and I've learned a lot. Now I can speak about bifurcation of rights and scripted and unscripted like I know what I'm talking about but I didn't before <laughs> well I'm sure there'll be some people ask about that <laughs> absolutely I, I strongly encourage it it was incredible learning experience I learned so much and and having ABC as a partner you know big giant behemoth but they have all their archival material that go so we had help with licensing we had some of a budget for licensing but there was just the resources available, human and archival, were were really tremendous. In addition to Ladybird's own material. Wow, wow. Well, I, I'd like to, you know, dig a little bit deeper in that, but we'll come back to you. Okay. This because it's it's really amazing and it's a wonderful series. So thank you. Thank you. Um, and and finally, last but not least, is uh, Barbara Allen, better known as BA. She's a filmmaker, documentary film. Um, her films have been screened around the world and uh, they've earned a dozen, more than a dozen Emmy Awards here in the United States. Um, she's directed virtual reality uh, shorts and currently she's working on a film about black resistance during the, the racial riots and tension in 1919. One of uh, BA's most celebrated documentaries is Dusabu to, Ob to, to Obama, Chicago's Black Metropolis. It's a biography of Black Chicago using biographical sketches to tell the story. So here's a clip from, um, from that film. And this is a section that deals with Black aviators Cornelius Coffey and Johnson C. Robinson. So let me bring that up. During the 1920s, Blacks were not only interested in the arts, history, and business, they also sought daring exploits. Aviator Bessie Coleman launched a generation of Black pilots. She would demonstrate that even if Blacks could not move out of the confines of the Black Belt, they could soar above it. Chicago is one of several centers of African Americans becoming plane crazy during the period of the 1930s. African Americans become more and more fascinated with what it would mean to be able to take to the skies as a kind of way to symbolically practice freedom. Cornelius Coffey was a fantastic pioneer black aviator. And he, along with his partner, John C. Robinson, was trained in auto mechanics. Coffee was a rather quiet, timid, and shy individual. And Johnny Robinson was daring, exciting. And Coffee told me that it was Bessie Coleman that when she died in this plane crash, they wanted to continue where she left off. So they applied by mail for the Curtis Wright Aeronautical University at uh, 1338 South Michigan. And they sent their uh, check in, their money, and when they came in for the interview to the school uh, is when they were discovered that they were black, African-Americans. And uh, the school offered to refund their money because they didn't accept blacks. They were very disappointed. Robinson took a job as a janitor in the school. 
he gathered up discarded student notes and studied them. He and Coffee used instructions Robinson found to build an airplane. But it didn't come with an engine. They uh, put the motorcycle engine in there. Robinson and Coffee convinced a white pilot from school to help them test the plane. They took it to Washington Park, where the pilot taxied around the field. He was reluctant to attempt flight, but the machinery ran so smoothly, he decided to take it up. And the darn thing flew. All right, B.A., um, thank you for that clip. And your film mentions in the title, it mentions former President Barack Obama, whose name obviously is well known and significant. But you also mention uh, someone named Dusabo, um, who may not be as well known. So why did you use these two men as reference points for this film? Um, well, Jean-Baptiste Pont Dusab was the founder of Chicago, and he was an an African-American male with some French history. And um, he was a founder and he was quite a character. He was, um, there's the, the Native Americans in the area said the first man to, the first white man to settle in this area was a Negro. And they were talking about DuSabo. Because DuSabo was um, this very successful merchant who had 100 people for him. He, he was a fur trapper, but he also had a millinery and a bakery and just everything in his compound. He was married to a Potawatomi woman whose father was the head of the Potawatomi in St. Louis. And it, he was here with his daughter. So he got six different tribes together in the, what's now Chicago to work with him in clearing the river so that more traffic could come through the lake and the river in Chicago. So he was, he was quite a figure. And when you read about him, the way people described him was the way people described Obama when he was coming out. Hmm. Young, he's so intelligent. He speaks six languages. He's everything. So explorers and in France and everywhere would write about this guy, DuSabo. So we gathered a lot of information about him and found a lot of records on him, even though it's the late 1700s. Um, People always looked, you know, in English papers and things that were in English, but he was French and he was Catholic and nobody keeps better records than the French and the Catholic. <laughs> so we were able to find baptismal records, marriage certificates, all kinds of stuff that, um, that let us see that parallel. And I wanted to put time points on it. We're starting here, we're ending here. And so... Um, that was the story. Wow. Now, okay, so we're talking about the 1700s with DuSabo. Clearly, there are no, there's no film, there are no photographs. So how do you deal with this visual medium and representing uh, men and women who are from an earlier time for which visual documents don't exist? How do you make them come alive on film? Well, what we did was recreations are one way, and we did have a wonderful actor portraying DuSabo um, throughout the entire film because DuSabo then became the spirit of the city that led us to Obama and the success that he had as a black man in a city like Chicago. But there are also um, different interpretations of what he looked like over the years that we also use some of those visuals and drawings and also his, his handwriting uh, pictures of where he lived. It doesn't have to be literally his physical face for people to get a full picture of him. There are other things. The things he left at his house, places he went, the church he was at, the priest, the like I said, the marriage certificate, this. There are a lot of things that help create that image that are not just visual representations of a person. So, but we did, we did do recreations. And because you're looking at Chicago from such a broad perspective, from the 1700s to the 2000s, um, how do you decide who to focus on in your bi biographical sketches? How do you make that decision? Well, you know, I, I, I could have had a 10 part series, but um, you have to break it down to who you actually have the most information about and what 
visually works better for you. Because there were stories I wanted to tell, but there was not enough information, visual of any type to um, make a really good story out of it. And some things we couldn't get access to, but um, other stories like the stories of the aviators, um, I, I knew nothing about them. And I, the wonderful archivist, uh, Michael Flug at the uh, Woodson Library in Chicago, the Vivian Harris collection, I had done a film uh, years ago about the uh, Chicago Defender newspaper. And I had done a piece on Bessie Coleman in there. And I said to him, oh, I don't want to do Bessie Coleman again. I've done that already. And, and it's boring. He's like, it's only boring if you think she was alone. And there was only one black aviator by herself who did this all, all, all along. If you realize there's a community in this, and this, and he set me on this voyage into these amaz this amazing black aviation community across the country in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s that did amazing things that led up to the Tuskegee Airmen. It's like they weren't, they didn't just, it wasn't, because for me, there was Bessie Coleman and then there was Tuskegee Airmen. But the stuff in between is amazing. It was so exciting that um, it's one of my favorite segments when they get into who these people were because they ended up, uh, John Robinson, one of the aviators, ended up as the one man Ethiopian Air Force against Mussolini in World War II. And this is like, it's like a Marvel movie. He's like a hero <laughs> with one plane flying in with the troops. And, and every black newspaper in the country covered this guy. He was like a hero to so many young black kids. When I interviewed Tamil Black, the historian, and I mentioned John Robinson, it was like he was a five-year-old kid again. He's like, oh, Colonel John Robinson, he did this, he did this. And he was so excited about it. And it got me really excited about who these characters were. And the fact that one of them was a woman, Willa Brown, and she, and she was teaching pilots in World War II. You know, there, there's footage mm. that the government took in one of those um, fighting war films of her actually teaching pilots how to fly. And she was like a gorgeous, she looked like, like Alicia Keys kind of look. Mm -hmm. And she was gorgeous and she would use her looks to get into places and then demand. So she walked into a newspaper and everything stopped because they thought it was some model who wanted to be there. And she demanded to talk to the editor. And she said, you know, we're, we're doing fly, they're black aviation, there's black fly, flyers out here giving people lessons, taking them on rides, and you need to cover us more. And not only did they cover them more, they gave one of the other female pilots a column every week to talk mm -hmm. about black aviation. So mm -hmm. it's like these, these people were amazing doing stunts and tricks. And it's just, you know, it's an honor to find this and to be able to tell these kind of stories. Right. How how long did it? In fact, Julia and Marilyn, I, I didn't ask you this, but I'll ask you now. How long did it take for you um, to uh, go from the conception, coming up with the idea for your projects, to its completion? Uh, B. A. How long did it take you to do this film? Um, well, it was unusually fast um, because it took about two years, year and a half, two years. Um, That's quick. Which, for yeah. Very fast, but um, because of the team I had around me and the access that I had, it it moved uh, kind of faster. Than and the team we're talking about the team at WTTW in Chicago. Yeah, the, uh, well, I had I, a, a team of people that I work with um, that were at TTW and weren't at TTW. They're oh. okay. the team that we built, and um, yeah, people were so into the idea and what was going on that we were working day and night it was almost like addictive everyone was and stuff and so excited about it and i had a lot of um young people that i brought in and probably more than i needed but i felt like they needed to see the process and to learn what was what had happened before them to continue on and it's interesting because there were a lot of young people who had watch parties for the film. And, you know, I'm, I'm most happy when 
very older people and very young people like the work because you know that means you, you're hitting it correctly. Right, right. Julia, what about for you? How long did it take? Well, if I trace it back to <clears throat> when I first started the book, a very long time, but the uh, podcast <clears throat> between we, we created the deck and the trailer, the slideshow, visual slideshow with episodic descriptions and the three minute, four minute trailer in February of 2020, we sold it and finished the deal in August of 2020 and started working then. And it was basically like flat out six days a week for six months. It was released for Women's History Month in March of 2020. So it was pretty much six to seven months, very intensively. Wow. Right. And, Mary and I was lucky because I knew the material, right? right? I had already written the book. I had already excavated all of it. So I wasn't starting from zero. If right. I had been starting from zero, it would have taken a much longer time. Definitely. And Marilyn, what about for you? I'm uh, afraid I can't remember in such detail as, uh, <laughs> especially Julia, I guess it <sighs> around two years, something like that, more or less. But I, I can't remember, frankly, COVID, my friends and I joke about this, time lost meaning somehow during this couple of years of COVID and it's very hard to, so what was that in, in April or was that in September no. and we all lost a sense of time and that that very much happened for me with this with this project mm. well before i open up um to you know our our attendees and if you have any questions please uh, feel free to put it in the chat i want to ask each of you um that if someone wants to follow in your footsteps to do what you've done <laughs> and 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 write a biography and poems or do a documentary film or a podcast what would be the first thing that you think they should consider before they attempt a project like this uh, Marilyn uh, I think there there are already um, other authors, other poets other than myself who writing novels or biographies in poems, but most of them are, are being published for the young adult market. So the first thing I would do is to look for predecessors. It's not, it's not an empty world there. There are other people who've done it. And um, just be willing to recognize that, that you're signing on for a major project. People who write poetry tend to write poem by poem, um, but signing on to do a biography means signing on to do writing maybe 50 poems. And that means you have to set your own personal likes and desires aside and serve the person you're writing about, uh, not serve yourselves. And that's frankly, not something poets do very easily. <laughs> so you speak from experience. Yeah. <laughs> All right. it's not about me. <laughs> Julia, what about you? What would you recommend? Well, I am in the process right now of producing new audio material, which is very much archivally based. <clears throat> when we say podcast, maybe we think of like sitting around in our pajamas and chatting, but the, what I produced is more like an audio documentary. So I say that as a, to say that the threshold question is what kind of archival resources exist? You know, if you want to tell a, a historical 
let alone biographical story about X topic or person, really need to make sure that there's audio to tell your story. And then the second attendant question is how much does it cost and is it in the public domain because the latter would be better. Speaking of how much it costs, um, your podcast has um, some wonderful soundscapes. It's not just your narration and actuality, then your narration. It's it's there's music, there's yeah. sound effects, is you know, there's the the archival sound of the time, like say if you're talking about the Vietnam War protest and that kind of thing, or even Kennedy's assassination. Um in terms of music, did you have to get a composer to create original music? And, and was that part of the cost of the podcast? It was, but we had a budget that had a small line item for music. And we spent that music, that money on a composer, but also on a music supervisor who helped us find the music. So the theme song for the show, we licensed from Cat Power. And it's it's very modern and speak. I think it was, oh, I think it was B.A. who said you were really gratified when you hit multiple demographics with your show. And that's what I think we were able to accomplish with the podcast, too. I've got 20 somethings and 80 somethings and everyone in between. And I think because of the music and also because Adam Pincus at Best Case, my partner there, is a musician, too. And so his he had just great sensibilities of of how to punctuate the story with sound and music. Okay, all right. So what would you recommend to anybody who wants to embark on doing a podcast based on their book or based on the research they're doing for their book? Call me, I'd love to strategize with you. I mean, I think I think that, the, but I do really feel like if, if you're like me and you haven't done this before, you need to have partners that know what they're doing um, and to have, to be willing to stick your toe in the water of the world of representation, right? Somebody in the chat said, what's WME? And having not just literary agents, but agents who can help you translate your IP into other mediums requires entering into a world of, of rights and film and television and audio. And I, I really encourage doing it because you'll learn a lot and, and, uh, but but again, the, the threshold question is, what audio material, if we're talking podcast only, is there to 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 illustrate and animate? Because people don't want to just hear your voice right. or my Definitely, voice. You know. Is that uh, the William Morris Agency? Yes, yes. But that's just one of. I mean, there's several of them. It just so happened that Best Case is represented by WME, and okay. and uh, right. that that's just how the chips fell, cool. and they did a great job. Yeah. Um, Barbara, what about you? What would you recommend? Um, to um, you know, decide what your what your subject is and how much material there is on that subject, visually, um, you know, stills, other footage, or you know, whatever, and really take a deep dive into that person's life because you're gonna be living with them and those <clears throat> for a long time. Um, but if you if, if you've never done it if you're just starting out with the idea that you want this, I think that a good place to start is to do a bio on someone you know or close to your mother, your grandmother, somebody in your family, and learn how how to take that deep dive in and how to tell. And because it's someone you care about, it'll be easier for you to bring things and and learn how to make them work and not work. And, you know, it's not just my grandmother's story. This story is for everyone, you know? So I think, um, I mean, you could do a bio on your puppy. Um, but, you know, a lot of things is to get into the heart and soul of that person or talking about and find those images and that audio and that how you're gonna bring it together. And, Music is really important. I'm glad you mentioned that because um, I had a brilliant composer, Orbit Davis, who did the music for that film, and it was very interesting because I didn't, I didn't give him a script. I told him stories and had him write music from the story. Told him, and when he 
brought the, the um, theme song, I literally burst into tears because it was so much of what we were trying to say. And I said to him, now I have to make a better film. <laughs> <laughs> great, great. There's a question in the chat. Um, had you all published a book before embarking on multimedia? Um, just wondering if having something in another medium might help, quote unquote, sell a book. Um, and that's that's coming from one of our um, Misha. Anybody want to take, take a stab at that? Um, I what I'm able to observe in the last few years is that. Again, back to intellectual property. In my case, yes, I had published this, the Ladybird book before embarking on the podcast, but the I don't think one has to start with a book and then go to podcast. You could easily start with podcast and conceive of, or conceive of a story you want to tell as two or three pronged, print, audio, and film, and, and hatch it simultaneously or think of it as think of your research process as develop as pulling material that is both print and audio and visual simultaneously so that as you're going along if you have your subject you're actually developing the resource material to have a multimedia project um, from the on the front end now, um, thank you. Thank you for that, uh, Julia. And Manard, <clears throat> obviously yours was a book, is, is a book, but you also have um, an audio book of your book. Um, did you have any, um, any say in who read your book and how that audio book came about? I, uh, I did, yes. Um, um, I think I made the mistake of um, being too much involved in it, the uh, publisher had already looked around and had suggested someone to read the poems. And I said, why would ego, poet's ego, uh, uh, why wouldn't I want to read my own poems? And um, the publisher backed off and I'm, I regret that because I've since heard the recording of my voice and heard a recording of this other woman reading some of, some of her poems. And I can see I'm a very deliberate, slow speaker and the poems come across as a kind of, I don't know, with a kind of seriousness, which is unnecessarily intense and I think they would have been more fun for readers if uh, if I had if we had if they had given me a sample of, of, of what she would have done I think I think she would have done a better job of it frankly mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. yeah. okay all right and B.A. you didn't have a book before uh, no, I start with other people's books. I thank these guys for writing the books that I can, <laughs> I can read to get the information that I need. Okay, cool. Um, there's a question for Julia. Can you clarify for us the legal stipulations around unpublished materials entering the public domain? Why are they not the property of the estate of the creator? Okay, well, I have learned a lot during this work, but I'm not sure I can give you the full fully correct legal <clears throat> answer. In the case of Lady Bird Johnson, she formally donated her material to the National Archives with some stipulation for when the material would be released. <clears throat> so that's basically like the estate donating something and it going into the public domain because it goes into the archives, but the National Archive system. But when you're talking about unpublished material that pertains to a private individual, then it, it's not a foregone conclusion at all that this will be public and you have to negotiate with the estate and lawyers are involved. And I don't have 
a lot of experience doing that. Okay. All right. BA, did you have to deal with any um, estate negotiations or uh, negotiations with an estate? No, not not really, because most of the stuff was um, public domain too. Or in they, uh, they, we did deal with some private estates, but um, in terms of the papers of, of the or pictures from certain families, but they were more than happy to um, give them to us. And we also struck up a deal with um, a couple of black newspapers, uh, historical black newspapers, Chicago Defender, the, the and all their other newspapers, which include like the Pittsburgh Courier in Michigan. So um, we were able to, you know, um, get around cheaper than it looks. You know, it wasn't as expensive as it looks, but we did have access to a lot of stuff. And it wasn't, um, we didn't have any big fights or problems or issues with anybody. They were um, really bought into the whole idea of the film. Okay. Another question, is maintaining control of the narrative and, and the project an issue when you're collaborating with so many other people? Well, it, it's, a, it's a collaborative industry. So you have to collaborate. You can't, you know, you don't always have the best idea and sometimes you can't see what others can see and are, Taking you and so you you compromise, but I mean you don't you don't you don't turn it into like a Disney cartoon um, compromise. But not there's anything wrong with Disney cartoons are pretty good. But you compromise, but you keep the integrity of what you went in to do. Okay, all right. I'll just say that um, this collaboration for me with both ABC and especially with Best Case was completely surprising in that sense, in that I didn't have, I mean, the biggest hurdles we had were having to, my having to agree to cut material, you know, to cut my darlings, kill my darlings. But there was never any matter of factual or interpretive dispute whatsoever. It Because it was all, I mean, I, I guess that's thanks to Ladybird, but also that you know the storytelling in the book gave us the arc that we adapted both for the <clears throat> podcast and I think that's happening with Don Porter's documentary too. Good, good. I, well, I, mean, I, said that I think people are afraid of they think that collaborating means they're going to give up something and it's really not like that at all. I'm, I'm glad uh, you said that. Thanks, Julia. Um, we're just about a minute um, out from this panel ending. Any closing statements or anything you want to impart on our uh, for our attendees to um, inspire them to move forward? Anyone? Well, I'll say something. I'll say something just you know commercial and vulgar in that sense, which is. I really was interested after spending six years with this book in maximizing the exposure and the sales and having as many different kinds of audiences consume my product to be, you know, kind of commercial about it. And so the, the path to the podcast was for me not just because her voice was beautiful and it was such an incredible <clears throat> gem in our recent history, but because it gave me the opportunity to launch a book and a podcast at the same time and to have many different eyes and ears on my material that I otherwise wouldn't have had. And so I would really encourage people to do it. But one thing I will say is that my publisher, which is Random House, I think is not all publishers are equally game now and they want to take podcast rights first and make sure the audiobook comes out before. And there's all kinds of haggling and negotiations now because authors want to produce their material and who controls the timing of the rollout. All of that is getting a lot more fraught because publishers are on to, and my publisher, I'll say this, 
believes that the podcast dampened sales, but I think that's impossible to prove. And, you know, I think you have to decide whether sales are the goal or exposure of your creative product are. For me, it was the latter. Well, thank you all. And thank you all for attending. Julia, Marilyn, BA, you have been a wonderful, wonderful guest. In the chat, I put in contact information for both Marilyn, well, for all of the panelists. So if you'd like to go back and look at the, some of their work and, and obviously get more information about them, please uh, use those links. And thank you for attending. Thank you, ladies. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everyone. All right. Bye bye. Take Thank care. Thank you. All right. No problem. Meet everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for attending.